Welcome, everybody. Welcome to Oxford. Welcome to Oxford Brooks. Um, before I start, can I just ask, just do a quick show of hands, who's most interested in mathematics? Who's most interested in engineering? And who's most interested in computing? Okay, so it's a, so it's a mixture. What I'm going to talk about is an introduction to our STEM courses here at Wheatley Campus. STEM, of course, everybody calls it STEM now, stands for Science, Technology, Engineering, um, and Mathematics. My name is Alastair Fitt. I have the great honor and privilege to be the Vice Chancellor of this institution. Um, but although I'm kind of the Chief Executive, my subject is Mathematics, and I'm still research active. I still have some mathematics projects going. I'm still a member of the Council of the IMA, the Institute of Mathematics and its Applications. Um, and I'm just about to finish, actually, eight years of being Executive Secretary of ICIAM, and that's the Worldwide Organization for Applied Mathematics. So that runs the hundreds of thousands of applied mathematicians um, around the world. And you'll know, just see a little quote there. Um, it is very important that we offer you the right choices um, to make sure that you have a rewarding future. And I think one great choice you can do is to come and do STEM courses at Oxford Brooks um, up here at Wheatley. Um, why STEM? Well, um, I'm a bit of a geek, I'm afraid, and I have been involved in STEM things all of my life. My whole professional career has been in, well, probably the M bit of STEM for most of my career. And I'm a bit of an evangelist. Our world has many problems, many of them caused by people my age, global warming, um, recession, wars, and things like that. But I really do believe that science can solve all of these problems if we invest enough in science. And by the way, by science, when I say science there, I'm talking about science in, in the form of the Latin word scientia, which means all knowledge. It doesn't just mean chemistry and physics and STEM. But STEM is a crucial component of the whole of science. So I do believe we can solve all of these problems. Um, and I wanted to just try and communicate my enthusiasm for STEM and for mathematics in particular by picking an example that inspires me and hopefully inspires you too. Um, and a really favorite story um, of mine, which has broken recently, and OK, it is a bit mathematical. Um, I'd, like you to, I'd like to tell you that to give you some idea of how the world of maths and the world of research all works um, in 2015. So I am really going to do some mathematics in public now. I might even prove a theorem right now, but stay cool, because I did this last month. We didn't have to call any ambulances. Nobody died. Um, it was all OK. Right, so here's an illustration of the sorts of things that mathematicians are doing. There's two sets of whole numbers there. And the numbers on the left have a different property from the numbers on the right. Would anybody like to venture what they are? Anybody know? OK, so let me tell you. You'll notice that all the numbers on the left are numbers that have factors. OK, so 9 is 3 times 3. 6 is 3 times 2. 44 is 2 times 2 times 11. And this number has lots of factors, including 2, but I don't know what they all are. These numbers are all prime numbers. OK, and by prime numbers, you probably know what we mean by prime numbers, is it's a number that has no other factor. You can't divide anything into it except, well, obviously 1 and obviously itself, but there are no other factors. And mathematicians have been involved in trying to determine the properties of prime numbers, um, well, for many hundreds of years. And if you're a mathematician, Something fantastic recently and amazing and unexpected happened in prime numbers. And I'm going to tell you about that. OK, so we all know about primes and numbers that aren't primes. Some people call non-primes composites. So every, every whole number is either a prime number or a composite number. And a natural question is, how many prime numbers are there? And one thing you will observe is that as numbers get larger, 
the gaps between the successive primes get larger. So a natural question is, well, do they ever stop? Do the gaps ever get so large that the prime numbers just stop and we run out of prime numbers and there is a largest prime number? Well, <clears throat> can I just ask, how many people would guess that the number of prime numbers is infinite and they never run out? OK, so everybody is right, actually, because the ones that voted are right and the ones that didn't vote, well, you knew they were infinite anyway. Um, so the number of prime numbers is infinite and they never finish or run out and there's no largest one and you can prove that they're infinite. And this is, this is often, it's a question that is kind of splits scientists and non-scientists because... People who aren't interested in engineering, computing, and maths will say things like, well, how can you ever prove there's an infinite number? If there's an infinite number, surely you can't find them all. There's too many, so how can you ever prove it? And how can you ever prove that there's an infinity of anything? Well, I understand that, but to prove there's an infinite number, well, we have a cunning plan called proof by contradiction, which is something that mathematicians and computer scientists and engineers often use. So here's, the, here's just the proof. It's just one page. What you do is you say, suppose there is only a finite number of primes and they run out. Well, we can find them all. We'll list them all. And let's suppose it turns out that in total there are capital N primes. So suppose they're finite and we'll call them P1, P for prime, P1, P2, P3, up to Pn. And that's all there are. Now I'm going to show that leads inevitably to a contradiction. So the, the easy way to do that, there are many ways of proving that the primes are infinite, but the easy way to do it is to say, OK, consider this number. If, if the prime numbers are finite, multiply them all together and add one and consider that number. Well, that number is either prime or it's not prime. If it's prime, well, it's obviously bigger than all of these because you know, you multiply them all together and add one. Big P must be bigger than all the P's. But we already said we had all the prime numbers, so here's an extra one. So that's a contradiction. So it can't be that these were all the prime numbers because here's a new prime that's bigger. What about if it's not prime? Well, P, big P is either prime or not prime. We've already found a contradiction if it is prime. If it's not prime, then it must have factors. And it must, in particular, have prime factors. So what are its prime factors? Well, I certainly can't divide any of these into it. Because if I divide this number p by any of these p's, there's a remainder 1. So it can't have any of those as prime numbers, uh, as factors. And so if it's composite, it must have a prime number factor that's bigger than all the ones that we already said we had. So that leads to a contradiction as well. And so that means there can't be, the only thing that can be wrong is our original statement, which is there's a finite number of primes. So there's an infinite number of primes. Now, some of you may have known that already. It was obvious from the show of hands that you did. So here's the big news in maths recently. So an amazing thing that's happened. If you list prime numbers, here's a couple of pairs, some pairs of prime numbers. You can see that there are lots that are two apart. So five, 3 and 5, uh, 11 and 13, 71 and 73. They're all pairs of prime numbers that are two apart. And these are known as prime twins. And for 150 years, there's been an unsolved problem, what we call a conjecture in mathematics. Is the number of prime twins also infinite? And nobody has been able to answer this question. All the finest and most famous mathematicians in the world think that, it, they're, that the number of prime twins is infinite, but nobody has been able to prove it. There's been absolutely no progress on this problem for a decade, and all the world's most famous mathematicians will tell you, or would have told you, there is no chance of this problem being solved soon. There's no chance of proving it soon. It's just too difficult. And one thing that mathematicians were working on, well, obviously, the question, is there an infinite number of prime twins? This is the same statement. There are an infinite number of primes at most n apart, where n is 2. 
Uh, that, that's the prime twin statement. Some mathematicians started working on actually what turned out to be a much harder problem. Is it true for different n? So it, are there an infinite number of primes four apart or six apart or eight apart? Again, there's been no progress on this uh, of any sort until in 2013, this guy, Yitan Zhang, who worked mainly at Subway and in a motel and had a part-time teaching job, the very small university, University of New Hampshire, small American university with no research capability, capability at all, proved to the astonishment of the whole world of mathematics this theorem. There are an infinite number of primes at most 70 million apart. Now, 70 million is not two, right? To prove that there's an infinite number of twin primes, we'd have to reduce this 70 million to two. And this came completely out of the blue. He was completely unknown. People didn't believe at first that he had proved it. I've looked at the proof. It's very complicated. It's 54 pages of very intense, complicated mathematics. I don't understand much of it. I understand the basic idea. Uh, it's very complicated. But when this first hit the press, it was posted on archive web repository. An amazing thing happened, which was a worldwide internet project called Polymath 8 was set up to get all the mathematicians all around the world to all work together to try and reduce n to 2. And the first few reductions that were quickly made 70 million was quickly reduced to 63,374,611. And then a day later, somebody reduced it to that. And then 12 hours later, somebody reduced it to that. And in the early stages of Polymath 8, just after Yitan Zhang proved his theorem, um, I talked to some fellow deans of mathematics. I used to be a dean of mathematics faculty and they were having to close their buildings because people just went crazy and there were groups of mathematicians locked in the maths building for days on end trying to prove this stuff. And some people just had to close the building and say, you people, you have to go home and wash and eat and stuff like that. <laughs> um, but anyway, it just took the maths world by storm. Well now, up till now, over 100 improvements have been made and N currently stands at 246. So we've got all the way down from 70 million to 246. Um, I believe the improvement to 250 was made by somebody from Oxford. Somebody has since improved on that improvement, 246. Will we ever get to N equals 2? Nobody knows. To me, this is just a beautiful and uh, inspiring and unexpected story because A, it's global. B, it starts to answer one of the most long-standing and difficult problems in mathematics. And C, it was all started by a shaft of genius from a complete unknown that worked in Subway, essentially. Just amazing. What's the use of all this? You might ask, what's the use of all this? Why do you waste your time doing all this stuff? Well, is it just mathematicians playing? Is it of any use? I can probably guarantee that everybody in this room has used the very complicated properties of prime numbers many times today already without realizing, because if you've sent a text or an email or you've looked at anything on the web or you've booked up anything on the web or you've bought anything on the web, all of the encryption for that is done using some technical properties of particularly large prime numbers, prime numbers with 100 digits um, and over. So you will all have almost certainly used some of these properties um, many times today already. They, so they really do have enormous uses. Um, what about STEM at Brooks? Hope everybody survived. That's all the mathematics done. Um, I hope you can see why it's so fascinating and why STEM people love their subjects so much. Uh, what STEM courses can you do here at Oxford Brooks? Well, it's all on the web, you've got prospectuses and things, so I won't try to go through them all, I'll just give a few highlights in a minute. Um, one thing I would say, Brooks is in the upper quartile for student satisfaction. We've spent many years trying to get in the upper quartile and this year we finally managed it. 
All of our degree courses are taught by research-informed, fantastic quality staff, and I know they all, compare, they all care hugely about the quality of your student experience. Um, and I can answer questions, more questions about that later um, if you want. So you might ask, why else choose Oxford Brooks? Well, one of the things we try to provide here is a real framework for your development in all of these subjects. Um, we need, what we're trying to do, we're trying to set careers in motion here. We're trying to set a learning experience um, in motion. And one of the things that we're really trying to do is to turn all our students into independent learners, okay? Because actually, in the world of work, what most people want is not people that have all the knowledge. They want people that have all the knowledge to get the knowledge, whatever knowledge they need. That's what we mean by an independent learner. Uh, of course, the courses don't stay still. They have to evolve um, all the time. And that's why it's important that our staff are all research informed. That's why it's important that we have so many links with industry. Um, where's our research at the moment? Well, the way research is funded in the UK is via a huge nationwide research competition that happens every six years and happened in 2014. Uh, it's called REF 2014, and research has been funded this way ever since 1986. It's called the Dual Support System. Uh, we're the only country in the world to do it this way. And um, if you want to know how good research is in UK universities, we are, if you take almost every population-weighted metric of research, we are numbers one and two, or two and one in the university, us in the USA. So England's a tremendously, the UK, I should say, is a tremendously successful research nation. Just one example here of our industrial connections. Um, we got an Engineering Excellence Award from Innovate UK, a funding body that helped Yasser Motors prepare for mass production of a really revolutionary e uh, electric motor. Um, uh, we, we have loads of projects like that. We have loads of links with industry. You'll see some of them if you um, walk around the place. I'll give three examples of STEM courses. One is mathematics. We're just launching a new MMath, Master of Mathematics um, program. This is an undergraduate course that will lead you to a MMath qualification after four years. Um, it's got an enhanced focus on mathematical modeling, which is what I've been doing for most of my career, and that'll be developed um, for the entire degree course. There's a link there, or you just go onto the web, onto our site. You can learn much more about our new MMath, so that's going to be really exciting. Example two, well, we've got a lot of experience of robotics here. Uh, CCT, our computing science department, uh, has made significant advances in, well, not just those three things listed there, um, but many other uh, areas too. This person here is one of our robots. We have many robots, but this is a robot called Artie. And uh, actually, if you buy yesterday's Oxford Mail, you will see pictures of Artie and me and the US ambassador who particularly likes robots. Um, and that's an example of some of the cutting-edge research we do in human-robotic um, interaction. We have a whole load of other robots as well that do, that do different things. Another example I'll give you, um, motorsport engineering at Wheatley campus. And like a lot of our engineering courses, you can either take this as a B-Eng course for three years or an M-Eng course for four years. The advantage of doing the MEng is that will give you accreditation with the uh, Learned and Professional Engineering Society. Everything is included, everything about motorsport is included in this course. And particularly, we had a whole load of quite famous Formula One people here last week, engine designers and team managers. And of course, one of the most interesting things about F1 is how it runs, how it runs as a business. Lots of very interesting things about the design and the aerodynamics and the engines and the performances of the cars. But how it runs as a business is very interesting as well because 
you soon realize if you go to an F1 team, actually they are not rich. It's, it's a multi-billion pound sport, but most F1 teams have a load of really expensive kit around, none of which is theirs. Everybody gives them expensive things, but they don't generate much money themselves. Great stat, every F1 team in the world now contains at least one Brooks graduate, and many teams contain many more. Um, and as you know, Oxfordshire is really a center for F1, and I think seven of the 11 teams are based here um, in the UK, and five of them are based in Oxfordshire, or something like that. So three examples there. We do many other courses as well, and I can answer questions about them afterwards. One of the things that we like to be sure of, we like to be sure that our research enhances the teaching so that the students can benefit from the research as well as the student experience. We have huge connectedness and links both with Oxford and places much, further, much further afield. Um, and that allows us a huge range of work placement opportunities and our links with industry gives us a great range of student placements as well. Uh, we have access to, to a huge range of well-known companies. And I think that that link between teaching and learning, research and industry is, is really powerful. And if you're going to be doing particularly engineering, computer science, maths and all the STEM subjects, that's crucial to having the best experience you can have. OK, well, that's all I was going to say. Thank you very much for listening. Very happy to answer any questions you have. Questions? Oh, thank you very much. Thank you.